Alright guys, today we're going to talk about the definition of a limit. And we talked about what a limit was and what it kind of means, but we didn't give it a precise definition. So what we want to do in this video is give it a precise definition and show you how you can prove that a limit exists and it equals a certain value. So we're going to look at some arbitrary function to start off before we define it. And I'm going to call this function f of x. So it's going to look like this. I'm going to call it f of x. And we're going to find a limit as x approaches c of f of x. That's our goal. Now, we know that the limit is going to equal some value l. We don't really know what that value l is. But we talked about what this means in the last video, what this equation means. It means that as x gets closer and closer to c, the value of f of x gets closer and closer to l. So I'm going to assign some arbitrary c on my graph right here. I'm going to look at I'm going to call this c. And as you can see, as my x values, this is my x axis, this is my y axis, as my x values get closer and closer to c, my f of x values are getting closer and closer to this one value right here, which we can assume to be l. So the question becomes, how can we really show that this limit is equal to L? How can we really show that this is the correct answer to our question? Well, what the limit means, as, as we talked about, as these x values approach C, my y values, or my f of x values, approach L. And what people realized is that as they get infinitely close to C, I still get y values that are getting infinitely close to L. Matter of fact, so close, that I could draw an interval around L as small as I wanted. And I could find an interval around C such that all the X values in that interval around C, except maybe C itself, would return F of X values in that interval around L. And that's actually how we ended up defining the limit, is that for any interval around L, regardless of how small it is, if I can find a corresponding interval around C, such that all the x values in that corresponding interval return f of x values in the interval around L, then I have shown that the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals L. So how can we write this mathematically? We're going to do that now. And before we do that, I'm going to remind you of a couple things about absolute values that will make understanding this definition a little bit easier. And that is that if I have something like the absolute value of x minus c, or the absolute value of c minus x, these two things, as you probably know, are equal. And the reason, one of the reasons, one way of looking at it is that because they, it's because they represent the distance between x and c. So if I was to put x and c on a number line, the absolute value would represent this distance between them. So that's going to be important to recognize uh, while looking at this definition. And this definition is called the epsilon delta definition. And you will see why in just a second. Oh, that's not how you spell delta. Let's fix that. Delta. Okay. So here's the definition. Let f be a function defined on an open interval containing C, except possibly at C. So let's take a look at what this means. Essentially, this means that if I was to have a number line of x values, and C is somewhere on that interval, or somewhere on that number line, I should say, we're looking for an open interval. And if you remember, an open interval doesn't have to include the endpoints around C, and for this limit definition to hold, essentially f of x has to be defined at all these values around C. So we don't care about the endpoints, but all around C in this interval, some interval, it can be any interval, f of x has to be defined, except at C. We don't really care if it's defined at C. So let's continue with the definition, and let L be a real number. So L is a real number, nothing imaginary. Um, the statement the limit 
as x approaches c of f of x equals l means that, and this is where the epsilon delta part comes in, for each epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta also greater than zero such that if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus c, so the distance between x and c is less than delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So let's talk about what this means. And it's important, this epsilon delta part is really important. So epsilon and delta aren't things I've talked about before. They're, they're, random, they're not random numbers, but they're arbitrary numbers that are greater than zero. For this definition to hold, for any epsilon value greater than zero, that means any real number greater than zero, there has to exist a delta value greater than zero such that when we are choosing x values that meet the, the, this inequality, that make this inequality true, then this inequality also is true. So what is this inequality really saying? Well, if you look at it, this is the distance between x and c. So we're picking x values that are a distance away from c, and that distance has to be less than delta. So we're confining our x values around c, and it can't, x can't equal c because it has to be greater than zero. So we're looking at x values around c, and when we pick x values around c defined by the size of delta, then our f of x values have to be a certain distance away from L. Essentially, the, their distance from L has to be less than epsilon. And I'm going to go ahead and erase this definition and show you on a graph, because this is what we've been talking about, is that if we have some function if we have some function f of x and this is our c value and we want to find the limit as x approaches c of f of x and we're saying it equals l here's what that means that means I can pick any epsilon value regardless of how small it is or how big it is I can pick any epsilon value that defines an interval around l and I will be able to find a delta value such that all the x values inside that delta value inside that interval defined by the size of delta will return values so here's my c minus delta interval here's my c plus delta interval and this is my l plus epsilon and l minus epsilon so all the x values inside this interval defined by the size of delta will return f of x values inside this interval around L, defined by the size of epsilon. And this is the tricky part, where for this limit to be true, we really have to show that this statement, we can find a delta value for literally any epsilon value greater than zero. And you might be wondering, how can you prove that? There's an infinite number of epsilon values. Well, we usually do it by writing epsilon as a function of delta, or actually writing delta as a function of epsilon. So when we get an epsilon value, we can just find a delta value corresponding to it right away. So we have to find a corresponding value for each epsilon value to prove that the limit is true. But if we are to assume that this limit is a true statement, then we know that given any epsilon value, we will be able to find a corresponding delta value such that the interval around C defined by the size of delta, if we pick x values in that interval, we will get back f of x values in the interval around L defined by the size of epsilon. So that's what the limit means. And we can actually use this to explain some of the things we were saying in our last videos about limits not existing. So we're going to look at one specific case. And you can look at the other one. Both of them make sense when you look at it this way. Um, is that the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of 1 over x does not exist. And if you recall why we said this, we said that it doesn't exist because if we look at the graph, we get this thing and around zero it just oscillates and back and forth between one and negative one and it continues to oscillate to the point where we actually can't even see it on a graphing calculator it's so dense and it oscillates in an infinite number of times between negative one and one so you can kind of see why we know that this limit cannot exist 
Because maybe let's say we want to say the limit equals zero, and we want to find out if that's true. Well, we know the limit can't equal zero because if we were to pick an epsilon value that is equal to or less than one, our epsilon interval would look something like this. And regardless of what delta value we picked, we would always get an f of x value of negative one or one at some point that would fall outside of our epsilon uh, interval. So we can't find a delta value for every single epsilon value. For, so we can't find a corresponding delta value for each epsilon value. So there's epsilon values where the, def, where the definition of a limit doesn't hold. And we can test any number, not just zero. You can go through testing any number you want, and you'll find that you, for some epsilon values, there'll always be some epsilon values where you can't find a corresponding delta value. So because of that, we say that this limit does not exist. So what we want you to get from this video is definitely the definition of a limit. Look over that. Make sure you understand it. But mostly that when you say a limit exists, it means that for any epsilon value greater than zero, you can find that delta value, you know, based on the definition of a limit that will set up those intervals. You can find it. And to show that a limit exists, you have to be able to show that for any epsilon value, you can find a corresponding delta value. Such that when your x values are in that interval around C, defined by that delta value, your f of x values will come out around L in an interval defined by the size of that epsilon value.